Thank you, Elizabeth. And um, this is actually my third time on this stage. I appeared here uh, about three years ago um, to launch what was then the very first Australian Government cloud strategy. Uh, that was followed, I think, the year later with the launch of our big data strategy. And now we're talking about the Internet of Things. So it strikes me that this is a spectacular forum uh, for, you know, uh, th th that's able to debate the, uh, the emerging technologies uh, that are going to have profound impact on Australia, both at a government and at an economy level. And what, how great it is that the um, AIA uh, you know, runs this forum because it's all very well and good for uh, those of us in government, when I was in government, uh, to have these sorts of discussions in the halls, as it were. Um, but I think it's, it's much more powerful to have it uh, in, this, in this forum where we get to have a mixture of, of industry and academia and, uh, and uh, public sector. Um, so we have slides up. So without uh, further ado, um, uh, uh, I just look a, a, a bit of a brief intro on some uh, Gartner themes and um, perspectives for those who haven't attended Gartner forums in the past. So first of all, uh, the nexus of forces. This is a, uh, essentially a fundamental concept within Gartner. We believe uh, as that the nexus is very much driving uh, innovation uh, across the planet where we've got uh, things such as, I wonder if, does this work? Oh, yes, it does. Such as um, social media driving um, seamless uh, socialization, uh, employees and citizens being uh, uh, em empowered by uh, mobile, uh, pervasive uh, wireless uh, solutions, um, IT as a utility being enabled through cloud, and big data and big data analytics and uh, new insights being enabled through um, uh, new sources of information. Um, I guess from the perspective though of the Internet of Things, the Internet of Things, is, it underpins uh, the nexus uh, to unleash really a, what is a digital um, um, industrial revolution. I think that term was used uh, earlier today. Um, we see digital business being the creation of uh, new business designs, um, um, you know, so blurring the boundaries, as it were, between the physical and, uh, and um, uh, digital worlds. Um, but what does that mean um, uh, for government? Um, how does uh, the emerging digital uh, industrial economy um, affect citizens, both affect them as well as um, how to affect their expectations? Um, what are the differences between e-business and digital government or digital business? I'm going to talk to that in a moment. Uh, we believe they are quite profound. Uh, and uh, do these trends um, affect all governments equally? And the answer to that question in the context of the Internet of Things is absolutely not. Uh, we're seeing quite a profound difference in take up and awareness and perception. Um, so digital government, uh, Gartner, like everything, has a definition for terms. So digital government is, uh, is government that's designed and operated to take advantage of digital data in optimizing, transforming and creating government services. What is in particularly important and why it's in red is digital data. Um, because for years and years, um, those of us in government have been designing online services, mobile apps, um, uh, other, other, other services um, that have components of the transaction that have to be completed in a manual format or in an analog format. Uh, for the first time ever in the last few years, literally, we've got to the point where we can realistically uh, ass uh, assume that all components of the data that's necessary to complete the transaction are actually held in a digital format. Um, so this is the, um, the sort of evolution, as it were, of the modern day uh, e-government, digital government. Um, I, when I first saw this, uh, this picture, uh, which was some years ago, it reminded me that in the e-government, I was the uh, inaugural uh, e-business national manager in Centrelink in uh, 2002. There were no online services at Centrelink in 2002. You have to say that and you have to think, none? Not one. Not one authenticated online service. Uh, when I arrived um, in November of that year, we turned on our first four transactions and it started. And now, of course, um, digital in DHS is the main game. 
well over 50% of the transactions that pass through the mainframe are in fact uh, sourced from the e-channel. Um, and uh, during the course of the next 10 years, we went through the sort of uh, joined up government and then open government. We had the Gov2 uh, initiative. Uh, and then, and, uh, and at, the, at the moment, what, what Gartner sees on the horizon is, is smart government. And, uh, but we see that digital government is the transition to smart government. Um, so in smart government, sustainable, affordable, and cross crossing boundaries, and that's jurisdictional boundaries as well as uh, commercial and government boundaries. But in terms of digital government, that's what the main game is today. I spend about 80% of my day um, talking and supporting, talking with and supporting customers uh, fr uh, from outside of Australia. Let me assure you, um, uh, almost all of them are pursuing, certainly in the first world, are pursuing a digital government agenda, and only a couple of them are starting to talk about smart government, but everyone's desperate to um, get to achieve this digital government uh, nirvana. Um, all right, so the top 10 strategic technologies for digital government, so every year um, uh, uh, Gartner um, uh, issues a kind of top 10. Uh, we've grouped them under three sort of head headings, in, you know, how we engage both with our our staff as well as our stakeholders and citizens, um, how we connect uh, with them and how we resource um, the functions of, of IT as it were. And um, so uh, you'll see that in the list published only a few months ago um, that Internet of, Everything's, uh, Internet of Everything appears as one of the key uh, components of the top 10. But I would put it to you that if you look at that list, um, IoT is in fact um, plays a significant role in pretty much uh, most of these. So in terms of digital workplace or, uh, or edge analytics, we can see ha how IoT has an impact. So it does in a lot of ways underpin um, the future of digital government. Um, who here has seen a Gartner hype cycle? Everyone said, so I don't have to explain it in detail. Basically, uh, basically we have here um, uh, new, new or emerging technologies. Uh, on this side, we have those things that, in fact, uh, we, we, we've been ha we had a great hope for, um, but in fact, maybe they're not living up to the promise. At Gartner terms, we call that the, um, the uh, slope of disillusionment. <laughs> and after you've slid down the slope of disillusionment, you fall into the, the, sorry, the trough of disillusionment. Um, some products make it out of the trough and they work their way up the slope of enlightenment until they reach the plateau of productivity. Aren't they lovely terms? Um, so uh, where is the Internet of Things right now in terms of digital government? It's just up there. So not quite at the top. Mind you, this, sli this slide is dated last year. The next version of it will be issued in about two or three months' time. And I suspect you'll find it right at the top. <laughs> um, I can't forecast that exactly, but I suspect that's what it will be. And so, you know, the timing of this, dis this discussion is uh, spectacularly good because I think what we'll start to see is some, you know, emerging concerns about uh, IoT, and I'll talk about some of those later. later. And we will spend the next couple of years um, probably attempting to address all of those concerns. And much like cloud was, uh, when I spoke about cloud three years ago here, um, we debated many of these sorts of issues around cloud and, and we're starting to see those being addressed and solved and cloud is beginning to be used in government, it, but it's very early days. So what does it mean? What, what, does, what does this kind of like Internet of Things mean for government? So I'm going to give you a couple of examples. We have this concept of civic moments um, within Gartner and it's an extension of what we call digital moments. It's an example where um, you use um, digital technology driven by some event, something happens, um, and digital uh, technologies then leap in to support you as a citizen or as an employee. And we've got, I'll, I'll just talk through a couple of examples here. Um, so this is not a civic moment. It's perhaps uh, an experience many of us are familiar with, um, but it's not one. Um, this is an example of a civic moment. This, this lady is el elderly, uh, has a mild uh, um, um, uh, mental illness, and lives at home by herself, but with support 
uh, in, the, in the near vicinity. Um, so the scenario here is that uh, the sensors in the home and in the gate in the garden have detected that she has left the house and that she is now wandering um, outside of her normal safe area. Um, automatically, the proximity um, uh, sensors in the garden can, can detect which direction she's actually um, headed in. Um, her relatives are notified automatically by SMS or, tech, uh, or, or email. Um, they can uh, immediately go to the cameras on their, that, uh, that are in the garden um, and access them through their mobile phones uh, to determine where she is. Uh, independently, uh, the voluntary organisations are notified and the gate is, is automatically locked um, and the caregivers are dispatched. Uh, they um, uh, arrive, check that she's okay, um, and uh, remind her of some games or what's on TV, uh, take her back into the house, settle her down. Uh, the entertainment system uh, automatically knows what she likes to watch, so it, it uh, can turn on her favourite program, and then they can monitor her uh, through the course of the rest of the day. So again, what's critical about that is that um, the entire process was effectively done through IoT-enabled devices. And that's not too far away. I, you know, we could kind of do that now. Um, in this scenario, we've had a major accident um, and we've got uh, public safety aerial surveillance platforms, drones, uh, obviously monitoring the, this, this crash. Uh, nearby hospitals have been notified. Um, civilian um, navigation vehicles have, have, have been uh, put in place to uh, stop um, uh, traffic in, 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 on the local roads. Um, there's been advice automatically issued around a hazmat uh, issue in terms of the contents of the, of the train and the tankers. Um, there's um, remote sensors monitoring the air quality, so whether there's uh, dangerous levels of pollution. Um, and the incident and, and uh, data and social media are being analysed to determine whether there's any additional data that's valuable to the, to the, to the team uh, rushing to the site. Drones continue to monitor um, the site and the first responders arrive to deal with the problem. So by the time the first responders arrive, they already know a whole lot about what the nature of the problem is that they've got to deal with. Um, and of course, um, you've got edge analytics um, also supporting you in this situation. So in the past where we've had very much kind of the descriptive diagnostic uh, experience about um, you know, what has happened, uh, with, with edge analytics and predictive technologies, it's, we are now able to determine what will happen. So in these sorts of scenarios, this was what might, what might play out, this is what we might need to be aware of. And we can bring into play a whole, uh, whole range of other devices, you like the animation, <laughs> um, uh, to ensure that we can monitor uh, the environment for public safety, uh, for tax and revenue, uh, for transportation, for policy making. So, we, so again, this is all sorts of I, I, um, you know, IoT enabled um, uh, opportunities. Um, now, there was a comment made this morning about um, the relative uh, place of, of, of things, of data in this scenario. Um, in the context of, you know, I guess, Gartner's expectations here, at, if we look at uh, the environment today, um, mostly the way we craft uh, government services is very much aimed at people. So it's this kind of direct interaction with people in real time. Uh, and that might be, that, that's true even in an online world. We craft it around how, how we're interacting with, with people. Um, as IoT plays out, uh, we expect that to change quite radically and it'll be, uh, it'll be things that become the dominant part of the equation. Right, um, I guess the other thing is that IoT will have a role to play in, an, in a very large number of contexts um, in terms of use cases and, and the sorts of outcomes that we want to uh, achieve in a range of policy settings. Um, you know, statistical services, security, um, you know, community services, civic infrastructure, transport, environment, um, immigration, you know, justice, defence, natural resources. Um, there are all of these contexts that we can imagine scenarios where IoT could be uh, particularly useful. Um, and we might choose to kind of prioritise those as government. Um, it's not, you know, that's a, that's a decision for government. 
um, and we would make those sorts of decisions based on you know performance metrics or you know areas which are of, of uh, which are particularly uh, n uh, need uh, to be addressed because of some um, some demand. Uh, okay, um, I I put this slide in here deliberately because uh, I thought well we spend the whole day talking about IoT and. I didn't actually see anyone actually define it, but someone chose the Gartner definition earlier. So you've seen this definition already, uh, and the little graphic I think maybe helps, uh, helps uh, better understand uh, this context. Now, I've got a few slides on smart cities, and I'm going to run through those, but I'll run through them quite quickly, because the reality is that we've spent a large amount of the day talking about smart cities. And I'm going to put it to you that there's a reason for that. Um, Smart, the application of IoT um, today is very much in the arena of asset management. And asset management is something that local governments and cities are particularly concerned with. It's less so an issue for state governments and it's even much less so an issue for federal and national governments. And so a proposition I'm going to put to you is that in fact what we're seeing is a kind of bottom-up approach to IoT. Um, it's going to roll out initially to state, sorry, to um, city and city-state uh, uh, governments, and uh, 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 progressively be adopted by jurisdictional layers above that. And I think that that's probably a pointer to some later evidence I have around the relative, relative um, um, uh, un unawareness of, of IoT at federal government uh, levels. So um, in terms of smart cities, again, you've seen much of this already. Um, you know, what could you do in a city if you had um, data and, uh, about, about these components of how the city was working? Um, obviously, you know, you can um, improve traffic lane utilization in rush hour, um, you can better uh, use your parking spaces, um, you can you know, work out how many, bridge, uh, how many lanes are open on the bridge, or in fact if the bridge is even open, uh, and, and control your ports and the traffic congestion. Um, this is an example of, of Grenoble, I won't go into detail, Grenoble, if you, want, you can look it up, thank you. Uh, Grenoble is a, a city that has done spectacularly well here, particularly uh, in the area of, um, uh, of transport. They've got to focus on also of, of energy management and uh, environmental controls. Um, New York City Midtown, this was mentioned earlier today as well. Um, they normally, th they believe that uh, congestion costs them $13 billion per annum, um, which is a massive number. They've spent all of $1.6 million here to put in place this traffic management system, which is not quite finished, but nearly. And the target is to save about 10% of that, of that uh, of that 13 billion, uh, that's a very good ROI. Um, uh, Santa Monica um, installed some parking, sp uh, uh, parking space monitoring systems, and this has results in much better utilization of their parking space. And in fact, um, this this model uh, is also being used in other U.S. cities and in Hong Kong. And if you look at that last spot there, uh, dynamic pricing. So you can pay more if you want that parking space during, during the business day or less if you're happy to have it late at night. Um, but it's not just uh, necessarily things that are owned by government that produce data. It's also citizens' uh, uh, assets that produce data. And we, we see an enormous opportunity for government, commercial parties, other players to make use of this citizen-generated data. Um, I just want to go into a bit more detail of, a, of, of an app that was mentioned earlier. That's the Boston Bump. Um, this is a, an app that as you've got your mobile phone sitting in your car, using the accelerometer in the, in the, in the phone is able to detect uh, that there's been some um, uh, uh, a pothole or something in the road. Um, and that relays the location of that pothole based on the, on the GPS in the phone back to the um, repair crew. Um, now, the fact that it's happened once is kind of interesting. Um, it might be that you just hit a lump of wood or something in the road. Um, what's more important is when you get a thousand citizens passing that same pothole, all hitting it and all reporting that information back to the repair crew. They have incredibly strong uh, and reliable data to confirm there's something wrong with the road surface there and they need to go there. 
this is this is a this is a radical shift from from the example we we, we spoke about a lot you know four years ago in fix my street it's fix my street involved a lot of interaction by the citizen you know actually taking a photograph and logging something in here that the citizen has done nothing except install the app so uh, what we're um, um, expecting to see is ex effectively a confluence of information, stuff that's coming uh, from government sources, stuff that's coming from um, citizen-generated uh, data. And what's playing out, of course, is the opportunity to kind of combine this data and use it in quite radically uh, new ways. Um, and the, the challenge for a lot of um, you know, CIOs and and, and business leaders, of course, is then to come up with the business case that justifies the investment in this technology. And these are the sorts of drivers um, that we expect to see appear in those business cases around you know, optimising uh, you know, asset utilisation or being able to charge for a service you might not have been able to charge for, or in fact charge more reliably for it. Um, being able to you know, remotely control devices or, or, do, um, or send digital content. Um, now, I mentioned earlier that I was going to talk briefly about uh, why uh, we think this is going to take a bit longer to roll out, to particularly to uh, state and, uh, and federal and national governments. Uh, this is a survey that um, Gartner ran um, late last year. The results were published in January this year. Uh, and I guess the key takeaway is that um, this, this blue and sort of greeny um, uh, chunk of the pie here, they represent um, those, uh, those members of the surveyed respondents, which were 463, that felt that IoT was going to have a transformative or significant uh, impact on their business. So that's in three years' time. Compared to more than five years' time, where the, the, it's a quite a larger amount. Also, the other thing to note is um, the businesses that think there'll be no impact. Um, so the no impacts here at 13 go to two. So um, it appears as though, you know, if I was to look at the Gartner hype cycle curve and also these charts, they seem pretty well correlated. Um, that we're probably, you know, two, three, four years before IoT is kind of mainstream. Um, IoT today very few use cases. We obviously talked about some samples today, but they're kind of the same things. Tomorrow, lots. Again, enabled by um, the, the, um, you know, the, 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 the wide appearance of, of devices. I'm going to have to race through this because I'm running out of time. Um, again, this is another attitudinal thing. Um, what's important to understand here is that the green bars, the, the intangible bars, they are government, education, banking and insurance. They're service agencies, service organisations. They are much less convinced about the transformative nature of IoT, much less convinced about it being a revenue or cost saving, more convinced about it having a small impact on their revenue or efficiency. So uh, it, it does appear that, as I said earlier, national and federal uh, governments are, are laggards in this area. And this is also, sorry? Oh, okay. Um, and uh, this is also confirmed here. So first of all, this, this graph is showing effectively uh, the increased adoption of different uh, vertical uh, groupings. So this is not all of IoT. Um, this is just these particular verticals. You can see our expectations of government. Here it's still quite small but it will grow to be probably the third largest in, the, in, those, in those verticals. Um, the, the dominant ones at the moment are the manufacturing and utilities, which again um, sits pretty well with the kind of smart city arena and, and the mining area. Um, concerns. So um, uh, these concerns have all been mentioned before. They're the same ones, you know, security, privacy, uh, Lack of compelling business, skip over that one for a moment, um, a, a staff with the skills, risks associated with business changes, uh, dealing with new technologies. Um, if you just ignore the business, uh, compelling business case one, you could say that each one of these is exactly the same as I would have been talking about three years ago in the context of cloud. They're exactly the same issues. And we've got over them now, well largely. Um, and you'd have to say that why was, why was the compelling business case not so profound in cloud. Well, I would suggest it's because of the incredible marketing uh, capabilities of many of the cloud vendors. 
who are probably in this room, um, but are very, very uh, focused on it. Um, so we need to address privacy, digital security, and we need to you know, earn the trust of, of citizens and governments if we're going to get CSIO to succeed. Other issues, disparity between infrastructure life cycles. So bridges, um, you've got a bridge, it's got a life cycle of probably 50 or 100 years. What's the life cycle of the IoT devices in the bridge? Um, a lot less than that. So you've got, a, you've got a maintenance issue there. Standards, lots to choose from. We've already spoken about that one. Who owns the data? Who owns that data? I don't think we kind of saw that one. Um, who manages the customer relationship? If you've got a third party in the middle, that you're relying on data, there's some sort of, who, who does that? IoT security lags, this is one we haven't mentioned and I'll just take 30 seconds to talk about it. Um, we're all very familiar with having to patch our iOS devices and our, and our Windows and Macs on a routine basis. What's the patch model for, for IoT devices? If they've got a life of 20 or 30 years, what's the chance that some hacker is gonna work out a vector to get into your IoT you know, field? I'd say it's pretty high. How do, we, how, do we, how do we maintain them? <laughs> I'll leave that as a question because I don't actually have an answer. Uh, complexity. This is, the, uh, this is the hype cycle just for IoT. There's an enormous number of opportunities here. Um, and, um, and, and government is where you would expect it to be, just uh, somewhere here. Uh, there, Internet of Things for government. Same, same spot as it was on the other chart. So it's just one of the items. Okay, recommendations. Um, I have the, I've had the pleasure of no longer working for government, so I can give you my views on what things sh should be done without having to clear them with my minister first. Um, so um, uh, we need to develop an IoT architecture and policy. We need to do it now. We need to recognise it'll be, it'll be one of these things that'll evolve and, and develop over time. We need to build awareness of IoT. Uh, it needs to go inside government strategies. This is not just at the federal level, this is at the state levels and, and local government levels as well. And start putting in place some experiment, experiments. Uh, working with industry, academia, vendors and other jurisdictions, so across jurisdictions, um, governments need to uh, identify those things that it has to do to make IoT successful, as a, as a, to support the interest of the economy more broadly. Um, and that's protocol standards, wireless frequency. I was very um, happy to hear the minister mention frequencies this morning, because this is, this is a bit of an issue. Um, right, and that's my last slide. Um, for those of you who are Gartner subscribers, um, if you can write down the code here, you can download some of these pieces of research. Otherwise, I'm sorry, I can't help you. <laughs> right. <laughs>